thanks, Bobby, and uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm going to try to use the uh, mic stationary here, so if I kind of wander away, just raise your hand in the, uh, the back. I'll try to get back on the mic here. So, um, where's the control? Uh, it's a little Okay, got it. Okay, I think we're going to just start uh, today by uh, take a little time and uh, discuss a little bit of what this La Nina condition is, La Nina episode that we're going to go into. Uh, and so you kind of understand that a little bit and then just kind of jump right into uh, what our winter is going to look like from uh, our perspective. Okay, so when we, uh, our agency, NOAA, starts making these long range seasonal forecasts, uh, we certainly approach it uh, much differently than we do day to day forecasting. And one of our uh, key indicators we kind of use is we look at this, uh, the equatorial temperatures, and we try to determine are we in a El Nino state or are we in a La Nino state? And as this slide uh, states, you know, if we're in El Nino, typically those sea surface temperatures are warmer than normal. If we're in a La Nino state, they're cooler than normal. So last year, as uh, Mark said, uh, we were in a uh, El Nino state. And this year, we have transitioned now to La Nino. Uh, so they, uh, the sea surface temperatures actually made a change in the early part of summer. And uh, it looks like, I'm going to kind of get into this, it looks like these, this episode is going to continue to strengthen and kind of max out in the November, uh, December time frame, but uh, last through the entire winter season. Okay, so if we kind of look at things, uh, just to give you a little more orientation here, uh, what the top chart here has is the actual sea surface temperatures. Just to orient yourself, this is the... Uh, West coast of South America, the west coast of Central America. The bottom chart is the actual sea surface uh, anomaly, so the departures from normal. So you kind of see here just, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, very, very cool sea surface temperatures of uh, about one to just less than the three degrees Celsius below normal. And that's kind of persisted uh, for a few months, so we've actually entered this deep state a little bit ago. This is a very similar chart. You just turn that chart on its end uh, and look at it. Know, about 90 degree chart, uh, a 90 degree switch. We kind of look at things from, whoops, last September, kind of when we we're here, running down through our current time right now, we're looking at this equatorial Pacific area here. So you can see last year we we're in this El Nino state, very kind of warm sea surface temperatures, and then sometimes kind of things magically happened here about May, June time frame. The sea surface temperatures all of a sudden got cooler. They continue to get cooler again as we are right now. We we're pretty cool and like that's going to continue to strengthen here for a little bit longer for another month or two. This is just another way to kind of look at that same data. Uh, one of the things we kind of look at are the, what we call the Nino region out across the uh, Central Pacific. One of those primary indicators is, I've read some of this in the literature, is uh, the Nino 3.4 region. And this is just another way to look at that data from like last October through this October. You can kind of see that uh, swap we made here uh, in the early summer time frame. And we've continued to have these very, very cool sea surface temperatures in this La Nina state. Okay, this is a uh, kind of a complicated chart. I'm going to kind of explain it, but kind of one thing to kind of take away from here is we kind of go run a bunch of model simulations, uh, a lot of climate model simulations, and kind of see what each one of these is going to tell us for the next several months and what this, uh, this state is going to be. So here's the zero line. So any one of these model simulations that kind of go above this line, it thinks it's going to go to uh, El Nino state. It stays below this line. We're going to continue in this La Nina state. So you kind of see here we are. We're back here when this model was run, and it looks like these uh, are going to strengthen this condition here uh, in the next couple of months. But all these model indications are rich, basically tell us that we're going to stay in this La Nina condition throughout the upcoming winter months. So this gives us pretty high confidence in knowing all the model simulations are basically going to keep us in this La Nina state through the upcoming winter. Okay, so, so what does all this mean? How does it all work? Uh, this is sort of a conceptual diagram, if you will. What the atmospheric and ocean conditions are doing during these La Nina conditions. So uh, here, again, here to kind of orient, here's the uh, Equatorial Pacific, the west coast of South America. So if you remember those uh, charts I showed you previously, something happened in the May-June time frame. And it all kind of starts by uh, what we call these easterly trade winds in the equatorial uh, belt. Uh, those of you who have probably been to Hawaii, you probably uh, recognize the term the trade winds, easterly trade winds. So these are uh, easterly winds that kind of flow across the, uh, the subtropics and the uh, equatorial Pacific. Well, when these easterly trade winds get uh, much, much stronger than normal, what they have a tendency to do is push all this uh, warmer sea surface temperatures kind of over to the western Pacific basin, and it leaves this really strong upwelling uh, and the cool oceans. Uh, 
uh, ocean water coming up to the surface. This is a really good condition for the Peruvian fishermen out the uh, most of South America, by the way. But anyway, it leaves this central and eastern uh, acrotropus with much, much uh, cooler than normal sea surface temperatures. All the warm sea surface temperatures are kind of pushed over into the uh, western Pacific basin. And so this is where a lot of the heat exchange and the energy exchange uh, occurs from the ocean into the atmosphere. Uh, it's sort of, we call it convection. It's kind of like a hot boiling water in your stove, and getting this uh, energy exchange of all your hot boiling water. And uh, so consequently, when that gets up into the atmosphere, it actually gets caught into the westerlies and it ends up strengthening the jet stream over North America uh, for the winter months. And so this is kind of another way to kind of look at that. Uh, Schematically, strong easterly trade winds, you get all this convection, this heat exchange from the ocean to the atmosphere, strengthens the westerlies, and consequently, this is the pattern that El uh, Ladino likes to set up for, uh, for the winter months. And we like to see that uh, the jet stream likes to have a uh, position of uh, aimed at the Oregon along our latitude in the Pacific Northwest, and so consequently, it brings us typically wetter than normal conditions. And Could you speak louder, please? Yes. Is this better? Thank you. And uh, so this typically, this jet stream likes to be uh, oriented towards the Pacific Northwest and bring us uh, wetter than normal conditions and cooler than normal conditions. Okay, so now we can kind of put all this into, uh, into a forecast context. So we're going to show you some temperature and uh, precipitation uh, forecast. And this, is, uh, this is kind of where our skill is, being able to term, determine the temperature and precipitation. You can kind of think of uh, three poker chips here, three stacks of poker chips. Are we going to be, you know, near normal? Or are we going to be below normal? Or are we going to be above normal? Uh, in terms of this case, in terms of uh, uh, temperature. Uh, so this is for October, November, December. So we're leading into winter in terms of uh, temperature. So when you see this uh, EC on the maps, equal chance. Basically, we have three equal stacks of poker chips, and there's really not much skill in saying of course the temperature going to go in either three, these three categories. But you see from the Pacific Northwest. We've got more poker chips in that below normal uh, temperature category. So there's a signal there that there will be a little bit below normal temperatures uh, until into the uh, winter months. If we look into the rest of the winter, here we go into uh, January, February, March time frame, and now a little stronger signal. Uh, you can see here, again, more, more chips in the, blue, uh, in the below normal temperature category. Uh, so that's how we're looking for temperature-wise. If we look at precipitation-wise, this is October, November, December, so we go into the winter, and we get to see this wet bullseye over the Pacific Northwest, so more poker chips in the wet category. And then once we get into January, February, March, we see a very, very similar uh, signal over the Pacific Northwest, continued wet, uh, so again, continued chance of being above normal precipitation. Okay, so this is a uh, chart I just kind of want to put in perspective, and uh, so we're kind of sort of finding out about this El Nino La Nina uh, episode. It's about 1950. So this is a chart from 1950 to down here is 2010. And so if you want to just kind of think of that zero line, all the gold numbers up, up on top of there has been El Nino episodes, the blue numbers has been uh, La Nina episodes. I just want to draw out a couple things to kind of uh, bring your attention. Here we're entering our La Nina phase. The last La Nina episode we were in was the winter of 2007-2008, which Mark uh, alluded to. Uh, prior to that, uh, uh, we actually had to come back into, uh, there was a three year running thing from 1999 to 2001. And kind of just point out kind of what happened in those two years, kind of keep those in, in, in your perspective here. So just kind of think about how many La Nina episodes we've had since 1950. And again, we'll go to so this is another kind of a, a complicated chart to try to kind of explain to you. So now if we go look at that previous chart, it says, okay, how many Lanini episodes have we had since 1950? There's actually been 18 of them. So we can go composite all that data and say, what happened in terms of precipitation and temperature? So this is the precipitation map. We kind of see here with the Pacific Northwest, these numbers are actually in millimeters. But if you do the conversion, you can kind of see where all these blue colors is, which is kind of where we live, Western Oregon, Western Washington. It's actually been about three to four inches above normal precipitation in 18 of those La Nina episodes. So, so typically, yeah, there's a wet signal there, but how much of the time has that occurred? That's what this chart is saying here. If we kind of go look at here, these little colors here, it ends up being about 75% of the time. So of those 18 La Nina episodes we've had, we've had about 75% of them have been above normal precipitation and on the order of three to four inches above normal precipitation. So there's a really good uh, signal there that 
it's going to be a lot winter. Temperature-wise, kind of the same thing. If we go look at the temperature composites, you know, it's not as strong a signal. We've actually kind of seen we're, you know, kind of bordering on zero, a little bit, maybe just a little bit uh, below, maybe more to one degree Fahrenheit. And the number of those 18 cases has only been about 50% of them. So about half of our La Nina episodes have been cooler than normal. So not, not as strong a signal there, for the temperature-wise. So you got a lot of questions on snowfall, probably. So we can go look at snowfall data, what's been occurring in when we're in one of these states. So the blue colors are La Nina, the black is what we call neutral, and the red is uh, El Nino episodes. And so if we can just kind of go look at a couple of locations, the one on the left is the Cascade Mountains, uh, the Stampede Pass, and Crater Lake. And the one on the right is Seattle Portland. So you can kind of see, historically, there's been a signal that when we're in La Nina conditions, we typically get more snow than average in the Cascades. And kind of the same true with Seattle Portland. We get a little bit more snow than average, typically, when we're in these episodes. Uh, Mark showed you this particular chart. I'm sorry about the, uh, the grade out here, but this is our Portland snowfall data since 1940. Uh, just kind of want to show we've had some big snow years. The biggest ones, 1950, 68, 69, and one of the most recent memory is the, the 2008 event. Uh, again, I wanted to go show you the, and I, I can't show you there because I definitely block out. The last La Nina event was 2007-2008. We got a goose egg on snow in the valley here. Uh, the previous one to that, 98, uh, there's this three year running total. The first year, we had uh, two inches of snow in, uh, at the airport, the next year one inch, and the next year zero. So each one of these La Nina episodes are a little bit different, and there's really not a very good uh, clear signal on uh, what the chances of low elevation snow is going to be. It's just, uh, it's just that's a difficult forecast uh, on a good day. Uh, no in this, this okay, so anyway, to summarize, uh, it does look like we're going to be in flood unique conditions throughout the winter months. It looks like it's going to strengthen a little bit over the next couple months. Uh, so in terms of temperature and precipitation, certainly increased odds of being uh, slightly below normal, uh, uh, cooler than normal conditions uh, temperature-wise. Much better signal on precipitation be increased odds of being wetter than normal. And it does look like we're going to have a good amount of snowpack, increased odds of being above average snowpack in the Cascades. Not so in the valley. It's uh, really tough to say what's going to happen in the valley. But we do expect an active winter uh, weather pattern this coming uh, winter with you know, several storms moving through us and a wet winter. And so just to kind of put this in perspective, we just put one slide here to go say, okay, what happened in our last winning episode? That was 2007, 2008. It was a very, very active winter year. That's the year we had the really big windstorm on the coast. It was a 36 hour duration windstorm for 100 mile per hour winds. Uh, we knocked a, a lot of the power out to the coastal communities for about four days. There was lots of trees down in the coast. Every east west road in the Guam Valley to the, uh, the coast was down. Big impacting windstorm. It was also a big flood event uh, that particular year. And that happened in December again. We had flooding on 16 rivers. This is when Vernonia flooded. Uh, so it was a very, very happy winter. I don't have another slide, but if you go back to that other previous flooding episode, 98 to 2001, 98-99 was a huge snowpack during the Cascades. That's when Mount Baker in Washington hit the world record for snowpack, 1140 inches. The next two winners was not quite so good, so uh, each one's a little bit different. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I have, and so certainly can open up any questions the audience might have for a minute or two before. Gets up here. Yes, from Portland has a lot of microclimates with um, the airport being in the banana belt. So, I'll, I'll start again. <laughs> Portland has a lot of microclimates with the airport being in a banana belt. So, did the variations increase or decrease in a La Nina versus a La Nina? So, so you, you all heard the question. Uh, Portland's a we have a microphone here, and you're absolutely right. Portland Airport is actually the driest, one of the driest locations around in Alama Valley. You go a little bit south or a little bit north. The, the average precipitation in Portland Airport is about 37 inches. Uh, we go a little bit further north into Clark County, we get 45, 50 inches. A little bit further south, we're in the 40s. Uh, so is there much variation in this? Yeah, typically in an El Nino year, we typically be like, are on the dry side of that. On a New year, we typically are on more of the wetter side of that normal. So, I don't know if that answers your question or not. But, if, but does it vary up and down the valley? 
I, I think we see those averages the same, even though you know, Portland's 37, La Nina, we're going to probably have the tendency to be above that. For the valleys where it's wetter, they're going to be above that. Their average, too. Everybody's going to be above their average, too. You know, La Nina here. Location will be below average. Bring us front row. I have questions. Okay, uh, uh, jet stream. We see frequently see in the newspaper or on television the statements that the jet stream is bringing in this storm or that weather and this sort of thing. Is that just a figure of speech, or do professional meteorologists actually believe that the uh, jet stream is the cause of the movement of air masses and sediment? In fact, the of air well, well, the, well, the jet stream actually does move. The storm systems move along the jet stream, and it's. It, the whole process is, it is complicated with fronts and temperature differences uh, across the air masses and uh, you know, uh, generating fronts. And, and the, the jet stream is basically the mechanism to, to move storm systems through. So the, the stream moves the air, the air doesn't cause the stream to move. I'm not quite sure what you're asking. <laughs> the chicken or the egg couple is, is, is the jet stream a cause or an effect? Well, I would probably say it's probably both. You know, the, uh, the jet stream is is moving our storm systems uh, through here. Um, we can talk afterwards a little bit. We get into philosophical discussions. <laughs> it's back to how the you know, Norwegians figured this out years ago. The floor run theory of the jet stream uh, to move the storm systems through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just curious, do you happen to have any numbers for storm systems in your predictions for how much snowfall we'll have this year? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Basically, our skill is looking at from one of those bands. One of the, but the, the question was, do we have any numbers on how much snow, quantify how much snow uh, we might get uh, from being the Cascades and Valley? And it would be on a scale to, to say that far out. It's, you know, it's typically, hey, what, what, what band are we going to be in? And yeah. it's below or above normal. Okay. I know a couple of the forecasts coming up do have actually specific numbers. That's some of the guys have set for us. So. A couple of guys do, do definitely go out more on a branch than what Tyree and the National Level Service has. That's their job, and we appreciate the job they do. Really good at it. Any other questions? Gentlemen over here. Yeah, um, do you have any indications of severe wind storms for the Portland Metro, what we might be looking at? So the question is, do we have any indications for, for severe wind storms? Yeah, to get any, the answer is no, not in these long range uh, forecasts. No, it's just really be on our skill and say, hey, we're going to have a big windstorm in December or mm -hmm. January or something like that. We'll basically just take every storm system as they come and look at the structure of that, and look at the track of it, uh, how the EPR, and it goes back into deterministic forecasting, the year-day forecasting. Uh, is this particular storm going to be a destructive windstorm or not? So, okay, I was, I was looking for more uh, the history. History. Oh, the history? Yeah. Of the destructive uh, windstorms. Actually, if we go back in the history and look, and look, we've had most of our, what we call our extreme events, these big um, damaging windstorms or, or other types of uh, damage, they actually occur in insulin neutral years, as opposed to one of El Nino or La Nino State. So the preponderance of it's actually in insulin neutral years for these damaging types of uh, events. One more question. <laughs> I'm uh, just curious if you factored uh, solar activity into this forecast okay. at all. Yeah, I believe so with the climate models, that I show you those, those traces of climate models, there's, there's several of them. Some of those actually do uh, factor in uh, solar activity and sunspots by the Okay, thanks, Bobby. Thank you very much. speaker comes to us from Fort Valles, Oregon, home of Oregon State University. Good school. I'm a duck, but I can say that. Uh, George Taylor, former state climatologist, now he's a climatologist with Applied Climate Services in Corvallis. Ladies and gentlemen, George Taylor.